All right, so we're going to go ahead and do our introduction. Continuing on with the TMCC Library Open Genealogy Lab Outstanding Guest Speaker Series, today we are pleased to welcome back Professor Robert S. Davis. Robert has built a research collection at Wallace State Community College in Hansville, Alabama, that pioneers promoting and teaching local and family history in a college environment. He holds a Master of Education degree in history from the University of North Georgia and a Master of Arts degree from the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Bob has more than 1,250 publications on record and research, as well as various appearances on television. His work has received numerous awards and he has spoken to hundreds of groups across the country. Today's topic is called Escape from Andersonville, Research on America's Deadliest Civil War Prison. This talk discusses the basics of the prisons of the American Civil War with particular detail on Camp Sumner, with the notorious Andersonville prison near Americus, Georgia. Within that background, the talk discusses the myths and realities of the attempts to escape from the prison, an almost forgotten chapter of the history of the American Civil War. So I'd like to extend a warm virtual welcome to Robert. Thank you. Uh, I presume everybody can see my PowerPoint uh, showing the prison and the title and such. Yes, uh, if not, let us know. Okay, uh, I come by this in an odd sort of a way. I loved Georgia history before I knew what Georgia history was. And I was blessed to have the best Georgia history teacher ever. I mean, when you went into his, I look forward to his classes because I had no idea what kind of a show he was going to put on for us. And in fact, he later got Georgia Teacher of the Year. But he told us one day, one day the class was about Andersonville Prison and a novel he had read called Andersonville by the great writer McKinley Cantor. I was so engrossed by the story that McKinley Cantor's Andersonville became the first big book that I'd ever read. Okay, uh, years later, I'm doing my family history and I discover that my ancestor, Hugh Columbus Martin, was part of the garrison at Andersonville in the 55th Georgia. And I had a good friend named Carl Anderson and he was great and he had been to Andersonville and he said, Bob, you've just got to see this place. So we took a day trip together down to see the prison, me for the first time. And he's giving me a tour and he's going on and on about this is where that was and this is where this was. And the whole time I'm getting sick at my stomach I feel like I'm a guard, the descendant of a guard at Auschwitz or something. It was such a horrible place. But uh, later I'm working at the National Archives on a completely different project. And I'm going through some Civil War records and I stumbled into a list of men who had escaped from Andersonville with some details about them. So I said, maybe this is something worth publishing because somewhere I had read that no one ever escaped from Andersonville. So I contacted the national, the Friends of Andersonville, which is a private group that supports a national historic site. And the head of it wrote back and said there were 169 people who escaped from Andersonville. Well, that kind of floored me, but I pursued the matter. And I decided I was going to write an article about escaping from Andersonville. And then the article got too big to be an article and it was too small for a book. And the next thing you know, I wrote an entire book on Andersonville prison called Ghosts and Shadows of Andersonville. And if you want to learn more about the escapes, more names, more details, things of this sort, then I recommend that book. Now, after I give you the presentation here, we'll take questions from, from you. But after that, I will go over a handout that I've prepared that Susan has mentioned and uh, some specific sources. I'll try to better explain the sources you need to check to find out if your ancestor was at Andersonville in some way and maybe learn something of his or her experience, his or her experience. All right, first off, we need to talk about Civil War prisons in general. Uh, neither the United States government or the Confederate government had any experience in mass detention of individuals. I mean, there were only a few state prisons that had been opened by the time of the American Civil War, and they were nothing like the problem that these governments faced. Uh, now, up until 
late in 1862 and into 1863. When men were captured in battle, they were exchanged. The garrison at Fort Sumter after they surrendered, they were never even incarcerated. They were just put on a train to go north. But they had these exchanges. So this really wasn't a problem. However, later in the war, for a variety of reasons, the United States cut off the exchange of prisoners. Now suddenly both nations had to find some way of housing tens of thousands of captured soldiers. Although to the very end of the war, individual generals, individual generals could authorize local exchanges of prisoners. And in fact, the final release of the prisoners on both sides was done by General Ulysses S. Grant near the end of the war. Okay, now Andersonville has such a terrible reputation. It looms so huge in American history that unfortunately some Americans in the public memory of history think that Andersonville was the only Civil War prison. As if both sides got together, they decided they would just have one prison and they would be Andersonville. But no, there were more than 100 Civil War prisons. And these range from everything from county jails to uh, large stockades like Andersonville and Florence and Elmira and the big prisons like that. Uh, there's a wonderful old movie with John Wayne and William Holden, The Horse Soldiers. I'm sure you're familiar with it. Nothing about it is historically accurate, but it's an awful lot of fun and it's a Civil War movie. But one thing that always gets me laughing when I see it is all through the movie, they're just all shaking in their boots that they're going to be captured by the Confederates and sent to Andersonville. But actually, for the period that the movie is supposed to take place, Andersonville did not exist for several more months. But that tells you the reputation that the prison had. The worst of the southern prisons were Andersonville, also known as Camp Sumter. Florence, Salisbury, and Castle Thunder. The most infamous of the federal prisons were Elmira, Camp Douglas, Sandusky, and Capitol Prison. Confederate prisoners were treated badly by the federal military prison system, but the federal prisons were so much better than those of the Confederacy. This was a lie that was started even before Andersonville closed, and that is that the southern prisoners were treated as badly as the northern POWs were, and that's simply not true. To give you a good example of this, the worst of the federal prisons was in New York State. It was called Elmira. And in Elmira, the prisoners got upset because they were given kindling wood to heat the wood burning, to heat the stoves in their barracks. At Andersonville, the prisoners did not have barracks, they did not have stoves. You know, it wasn't, they were doing good if they had something to burn. Whereas at Elmira, they're upset because they're not being given coal, coal to burn. Uh, to give you a, a stark example of that. And in fact, in many Northern prisons, you could leave the prison if you agreed not to rejoin the Confederate military. And that's what many people did. They were taken prisoner by the North. They went to these prisons. Some of them joined the Union Army to protect people in places like Nevada from Indian attack. They became known as the galvanized Yankees. Some of the Confederate prisoners of war were allowed to go if, you know, to get a job at a textile factory or something in the North. And as the North, Northern armies increasingly occupied the South, if you agreed not to rejoin the Confederate military and your home was now behind the federal lines, you could talk the Yankees into letting you go home. And so the Confederacy really had nothing like that, although the Confederacy did enlist Union soldiers from prisons like Andersonville. All right, uh, anyway, both sides were a disgrace in how they treated their prisoners. Uh, and I'm not saying that any of the federal prisons were nice places I would want to be either. Um, Many of them were horrible places, but there was nothing in the American experience up to this point that was anything like Andersonville. And in fact, American soldiers would not see anything as horrible as Andersonville 
until the World War II prison camps of our enemies. But uh, to give you some idea of how bad things were within the Confederacy as a whole, there's a famous letter by General Grant and President Lincoln has written to General Grant asking if it would be possible to bring back the prisoner exchange so the prisoners at Andersonville could be released. And Gen the General Grant's reply, the part that's always quoted, Grant says we would do a better service to those than all of our prisoners if we did not help the Confederacy to prolong the war by releasing the, our prisoners. Instead, let's just finish the war and then everybody gets to go home. Now, what is never quoted from the Grant letter, except in my book, is the next passage, where General Grant says, but Mr. President, since you would like to have the prisoners released, I've agreed to release all of our prisoners if the Confederacy agrees to release all of its prisoners, all of its prisoners. And this was done, but the bureaucracy on both sides was so painfully slow that by the time the prisoners were actually released, the war was over anyway. But the interesting thing about it is the last line in that letter where General Grant says, but Mr. President, what do we do about the Confederate prisoners we're holding who do not want to be exchanged? They do not want to go back to the Confederate Army. Uh, anyway, the they say the prisoners were exchanged. All right, uh, most Civil War prisoners were not shot by their guards. The Civil War prisoners chiefly died from disease. In those days, very little was understood about disease. And if you brought large groups of people together, a lot of them are going to get sick, a lot of them are going to die. Most of the prisoners, most of the soldiers who died as prisoners of war on either side died from disease. Most of the soldiers who died during the war died from disease by an overwhelming majority. Uh, and so it also was in the prison camps. All right, the story of Andersonville really begins a month after the prison, well, actually a few weeks after the prison began. In March of 1864, what was known as the Federal Galgo Raid attempted to rescue the, the federal prisoners being held at Bell Island Prison in Richmond, Virginia. This raid failed, but it so terrified the Confederate officials that they decided to immediately ship all of their federal prisoners to the new prison in South Georgia that was being built called Camp Sumter. The walls of the stockade had not even gone up yet and they're already shipping prisoners to Camp Sumter. Because Camp Sumter, which is near America's Georgia, is so far into deep southwest Georgia, it was thought if you could get the prisoners there, nobody could rescue them. They probably could not escape, etc. And now the Confederate officials order all these prisoners shipped to Andersonville as quickly as possible. And somebody in the bureaucracy seems to have forgotten that the prison would only be designed to hold 9,000 prisoners. On its worst day, Andersonville held 33,006 prisoners. 33,006 prisoners. On its worst day, there was barely enough room for everyone to lie down at the same time. And of course, this encouraged disease, but it also creates a huge problem of feeding the prisoners a huge sanitation problem, etc. Now, even worse is where Camp Sumter was set up. Nobody wants a prison camp in their neighborhood. And all of the places that this prison camp was supposed to go up, all pulled political clout and got it moved from their neighborhood. So the only place they could finally find to build this prison was a place called Anderson Station, which was just a whistle stop on a railroad. 25 people lived near the station. 75 people lived in the neighborhood. This is well where near enough people to feed 33,000 prisoners, plus 15 or 1,600 guards, plus 500 slave workers. Nothing like that. So the food had to arrive 
on his single track railroad network from Columbus, Georgia. And then these Confederate commissaries did not have enough food to feed the soldiers and the civilians who worked for the Confederacy. They certainly did not have enough left over for prisoners of war in an obscure place like Andersonville. Well, by the way, the name Andersonville is what the prisoners and the guards came to call Anderson Station. Uh, and the situation was so bad that even the guards at Andersonville would stop trains in order to rob the trains for food. Okay. Uh, now, Andersonville Prison held federal civilians who were captured, sailors, and soldiers. They could be black and white. Andersonville was integrated. Most of the black prisoners, however, were used on work gangs, which actually unintentionally work to their benefit. Because if you're on the work gang, you get twice the regular rations. So they actually stood a better chance of survival. And by being on a work gang, they were not in the stockade where they were more likely to get sick and more likely to die from illness. Um, the only federal officers who were held at Andersonville were those who commanded black soldiers. The Confederacy considered arming black African Americans as soldiers as paramount to a slave rebellion. And so the officers of the black federal units, uh, they were not allowed to be exchanged for other officers and they were not allowed to be treated as officers. So instead of going to the officer's prison in Macon, they were sent to Andersonville, where they were presumably going to stay for no, with no hope of an exchange. Also at Andersonville, the hospital staff refused to treat officer, white officers of black soldiers. There were at least three women who were held at Andersonville, and there may have been more. The records are kind of vague at that. And one of the women, gave birth while she was at Andersonville. Her husband was a sea captain named Herbert Hunt. He was he, she was taken prisoner with him when his ship was captured. She stayed with him even though she was pregnant because she believed he would be exchanged soon. They ended up staying at Andersonville until May of 1865 when they were almost the last people to leave Andersonville. The baby, by the way, died sometime after February of 1865. Um, the prison was so bad that a man named Spencer Ambrose wrote that you could smell the prison. If the wind was right, you could smell Andersonville two miles before you got there. Sanitation was atrocious there. And the prison was so covered in insects that it looked like the ground was moving. Guards, including Brigadier General John Winder, the commandant, guards on the wall who were exposed to the prison, developed a terrible facial tick, something like Bell's palsy. All right, whole books have been published on Andersonville as an example of systems failure how the food system failed, the security system failed, the command system failed, etc. Several different men were commandant at Andersonville, and some of them tried to do right by the prisoners. Some of them even tried to have the prison closed and the prisoners moved to better locations where they could be better fed and better secured. Ironically, one of the great mistakes in American history, and this is reprinted even in histories of Andersonville. Henry Wirtz, the Swiss born crippled homeopathic doctor at Andersonville was never commandant of Andersonville. He never commanded at Andersonville, except when all the officers above him found excuses to be away from the prison and he, the responsibility was dumped on him. He got he get the reputation of being the commandant because since he was immediately in charge of the prisoners, he was the only Confederate officer most of the prisoners ever knew. So they presumed he was in charge. 
Actually, he was just a foul mouth mid-level bean counter. All right. Now, that is to say, not to say that Verts did not have an impact on the prison. When he got to Andersonville a month after it opened, after the prison had opened, it was a mess. It was so badly ran, there were no guard posts. It was just a stockade. He had the guard post put up on the wall. He has had guards assigned to the prison. If it had not been for Henry Verts, probably the prisoners would have simply pushed down the stockade wall and walked out in mass and kept going. Verts tried to do things for the prisoners. There was a simple uh, one sluggish stream that went through the prison. It became a terrible source of water because everybody did their business in it. Verts tries to dam the stream. So there's a section for bathing, a section for a latrine, and a section for drinking water. But he builds these dams and the prisoners break up the dams to steal the wood for their escape attempts and to build their hobbles. Verts gives tools to the prisoners so they can dig wells. But instead of digging wells, the prisoners use the tools to try to dig escape tunnels. And many critics in the North said of the prisoners at Andersonville that much of their problems were themselves because they refused to accept authority, they refused to accept discipline, they refused to clean themselves and take better care of themselves. Uh, I won't co comment on that one way or the other. When things were at their worst at Andersonville, Captain Verts allowed a delegation of the sergeants to be sent to the federal lines to plead for reopening the exchange so that the prisoners at Andersonville could go home. The sergeants actually met Abraham Lincoln, and this is what led to Abraham Lincoln writing to General Grant, asking Grant about reopening the exchange. Commandant Brigadier General John H. Winder pleaded for the prisoners. He asked the Confederate government to send the prisoners home. He said, we cannot secure the prisoners. We cannot feed the prisoners. So for God's sake, he writes, let's just send them back to the federal lines out of a sense of decency. Uh, his request for his pleas were ignored. Various Confederate inspectors were sent to Andersonville. Like any incompetent bureaucracy, the Confederate government decided to study the problem instead of trying to solve the problem. So they would send inspectors to Andersonville, and those reports come back that this is a chamber of horrors beyond imagination. That something needs to be done, and here's a list of what needs to be done. But none of this was ever done. Nothing was ever done. One of my favorite, that's general, that was general uh, winder up on the upper left, by the way. Uh, one of my favorite letters from him is to the Confederate government, where he writes that he has 25,000 prisoners, he has 1,500 guards, he has 500 enslaved people working for him. He says what he does not have is even one single ration in the camp. One third of the prisoners who entered Andersonville are today in the prison cemetery. That's almost 13,000 men. Many others died uh, after release from the, from the effects of having been prisoners there, including suicide. The camp's Confederate personnel also suffered from ailments and even death from being at the prison. Andersonville is the deadliest prison in America in America's history, with the sole exception of the Jersey. The Jersey was a British prison hulk during the American Revolution outside of uh, New York City. It had a deadlier, it had a higher mortality rate than even Andersonville. Um, for most of the prison's history, the prisoners had no shelter except for holes in the ground that they made for themselves. They would get a piece of cloth or a tent or something, and then they would dig a hole under it because it's cooler being underground. Also, you could hide an escape tunnel that way. 
But these things they call shebangs. They call shebangs. Uh, they had a hospital at Andersonville, but he did not have the food, the medicine, or the medical science to treat what ailed the prisoners. The biggest thing that the prisoners needed was space and a decent food. Malnutrition makes disease so much worse, makes so much worse. And one of the doctors at Andersonville, who later wrote a book defending the prison, was in the last days of the war accused of stealing $100,000 intended to buy medicine for the prisoners. Few prisoners were shot. Few prisoners were shot. Six of the prisoners were executed by other prisoners. Now that's an interesting story in itself. One of the prisoners was also like Captain Wirtz from Switzerland. And after being put in the prison stockade, he was robbed. And he goes to Captain Wirtz and complains. And Wirtz has enough, has had enough of the prisoners robbing other prisoners. So without even bringing a gun with him, he rides out into the no man's land around the stockade, around where the prisoners are. And he informs them that he's not going to feed any more of them until they identify the bandits in their camp and allow his guards to arrest them. And so that's what the prisoners do uh, in order to get fed. They rat out their fellow prisoners who are thieves and murderers. Verts has these locked up men locked up. He then tells the prisoners that they will have a court martial and they will try the bandits and murderers, or he will release them back into the general population. So with General Sherman's permission, the prisoners hold a trial and sentence six of the men to hang. Other prisoners were sentenced to a beating and some of them may have been killed in the beating. The Confederate government, as an example of a thoroughly incompetent bureaucracy, like the United States government at that time, the Confederate government was unable to provide the soldiers and personnel at Andersonville with adequate food or shelter. But yet, late in the war, to keep the prisoners from being rescued by General Sherman, the Confederate government was able to move tens of thousands of these prisoners to other new prisons that the Confederacy was building. And at the near the end of this time, the Confederate government was able to fortify Andersonville to prevent the remaining prisoners from being rescued. They could take, the Confederate government could take these actions, but could not find the means to feed and take care of the prisoners. Even before the war ended, stories circulated about the horrors of Andersonville, including from former prisoners. Americans saw this in the North, Americans in the North saw this as an example of white cruelty in the South, the same white cruelty that Southerners used to justify, um, to justify slavery. The horrors of Andersonville were actually exaggerated. I have a hard, I had a hard time writing that because it's hard for me to wrap my mind around they were exaggerated. And the brutality found in federal prisons went ignored. No one ever discussed, nobody ever investigated what was going on at Camp Douglas in Chicago or Elmira in New York State. Um, anyway, it is, no one was ever sent to Andersonville to die. Andersonville and the other Confederate prisons were not Nazi concentration camps. They were never intended as a means of killing anybody. It was the incompetence of both governments that was responsible for that. Okay, Southerners from Jefferson Davis down defended or lied about the prison. And there are all sorts of stories like the Northern prisons were just as bad. That's not true. The guards at Andersonville died at the same rate the prisoners did, also not true. Um, uh, Henry Verts was this monster who killed prisoners. No, that's not true either. But the list goes on and on. It was very partisan after the war, and it still is today. 
Even today, there are people who condemn or defend Andersonville. Uh, almost immediately after the war, Andersonville became a national cemetery. And believe it or not, it is the only national member of the National Park Service that is still an open and active national cemetery. If you're a veteran, you and your spouse can be buried at Andersonville Prison at the National Cemetery there. Of course, I can imagine trying to explain, well, we just got through, my father and mother are buried at Andersonville. Your father was in the Civil War? No, no. Your father was in Korea or whatever. Okay. Uh, anyway, the hospital, the uh, National Cemetery was organized by Clara Barton, and there is a picture of her and her helpers raising the United States flag over the cemetery at Andersonville. Swiss-born Captain Henry Wirtz was the highest ranking officer at Andersonville who had no political clout. Probably they would have tried General Winder, but he was dead by then. Wirtz was the only, as I said, the only officer most of the prisoners knew. He was not allowed to mount a defense at the illegal military tribunal that condemned him to death. He hanged on the site of the modern United States Supreme Court building on November 10th, 1865. Andersonville has more records than any other Confederate prison camp, but only because Records were saved for special reasons, such as the trial of Captain Wirtz. Dorrance Atwater, he was a prisoner and a clerk at Andersonville. He managed to smuggle out the burial registry at Andersonville. And that's how we know which prisoners are buried in which graves. And nothing, oh, practically nothing survives from the other Confederate prisons. Now let me say something about Atwater's list. The Jack, late Jack Lundquist spent many years, spent years trying to assemble the most complete list of the men who were held by the Confederacy as POWs. He came up with a number. He came up with a number of men who are bare, who uh, he had records of who went to Andersonville, but he could find no further record of them. And that number. That number corresponds to roughly half, uh, equal to half of the men who were buried in unknown graves at Andersonville. That is, the soldier died and nobody knew who he was. Curiously, the rest of the number is made up by men who are buried at Andersonville, but there is no record that they ever served in the Union military. What's going on here? The prisoners would lie about their identities, or they'd have, whether they'd have two identities. See, half the camp was fed at a time in, the, in each day, so the prisoners would the prisoners would adopt a second name so that they could be fed twice. No doubt, this kept a lot of them alive. But what happened is that half of, of a certain number of them were buried under their alias, not under their real name. And some of them, I think, did this because they wanted their families to think that they died quickly on some battlefield somewhere and not never know that they died horribly at Andersonville. That's the execution of Captain Verbs there. All right. Now this talk is supposed to be about escaping from Andersonville. So let's actually talk about escaping from Andersonville. All right, even at Andersonville, some prisoners were exchanged and some prisoners were not allowed, not allowed to be part of the exchange, use the exchange as an escape, means of escape. Some of the, two of the prisoners escaped by bribing the guards to put them on an exchange they were not supposed to be on. In another instance, one of the prisoners murdered one of the guards, or killed one of the guards, rather, killed one of the guards, took his uniform and musket, and pretended to be a guard 
in order to escape by train when prisoners were leaving on an exchange. But my absolute favorite escape story at all involves an exchange. There was a young man named Passmore Hoops. What a name, Passmore Hoops. He was in the Pennsylvania Reserves when he was captured at Gettysburg. And after trying to escape several times, he finds himself at Andersonville. The prison is going to have a special exchange where the sickest prisoners are going to be shipped to the federal lines. He knows that if he does not get on that train, he's going to die. However, the camp doctors do not think he is sick enough to qualify for the exchange. Our poor hero is walking back to the stockade heartbroken. And then an idea from the, that comes from desperation hit him, and it was a wonderful idea. He runs to the stockade, and one of the guards shouts, what are you running for? He said, the doctor said it was okay for me to go on the exchange, but I came back to get my bag. So he goes into the stockade, gets his bag, and the guard is yelling, well, hurry, the train is leaving. And so he gets aboard the train with his duffel bag, uh, having basically lied his way onto the train. Before anybody can check the roll, he jumps from the train and makes it safely to federal lines. All right, Anderson Station was hundreds of miles from the federal lines. It essentially existed in an unpopulated desert and was surrounded by difficult terrain inhabited by people who had relatives fighting the Union Army, and some of whom had lost relatives fighting the Union Army. The pr prisoners were severely malnourished, but had to save food for a long journey. Digging tunnels could get, get you killed in a cave-in. Digging tools were hard to come by. Direction was a problem. At least one group of miners, that's what they call prisoners who were trying to dig their way out, one group of miners tried to dig a tunnel under the deadline and under the wall, and somehow they lost their direction underground, and they dug the tunnel back into the prison camp where the guards caught them in their tunnel. But you could lose direction and you could die from a cave-in. The guards were very sympathetic to the prisoners, and if they heard screams or shouts that there had been a cave-in, the guards would immediately rush there to dig out the prisoner if they could. Prisoners who tried to dig their way out were punished, but it was not a severe punish, punishment. And in one of the escape tunnels that was caught, it was such so well engineered, it was so well engineered that the guards gave the the miners double rations in appreciation for the quality of their work. Okay, uh, also you had to hide the dirt from the tunnels and that could present all sorts of problems as well. The guards were always on the lookout for tunnels. Guards were always on the lookout for tunnels and they were using probes and things like this to look for the tunnels. Very few prisoners escaped from the tunnel, through the tunnels and maybe none of them actually did. But the tunnels become a wonderful form of recreation because Andersonville was a painfully boring place and that no doubt led to the suicides or, or the de otherwise deaths of many of the prisoners. But tunneling gave you something to do, some form of resistance. Now I should also mention that the prisoners at Andersonville also played a game not unlike baseball. Uh, we don't. We only have one account of this, and no, we don't know if they ever played the Confederate guards or not. All right, you're trying to dig a tunnel, or you're coming up with some other scheme to escape. Your fellow prisoners might betray you for as, a reward of as little as a plug of tobacco. Now, what's so important about a plug of tobacco? You could trade that to the guards for food. If you got out of the prison. South Georgia has snakes, spiders, and alligators. Escape prisoners will become hungry and lost until they finally turn themselves in. Escape was punished, but especially if the prisoner had promised not to escape from a work detail and did so anyway. This is the point where I tell you the story of my favorite escapee of all, Little Frenchie, better known as Fredo. 
At Captain Vertz's trial, it was said that Captain Vertz killed Fredo, shot him dead. Actually, Fredo escaped and lived a long life. Now, little Frenchie or Fredo, he had a bad case of what we call barbed wire disease. Most of the people who escaped from Andersonville were people who would have escaped from the Ritz-Carlton if that's where they were being held. Some people just will not be confined. And we've all known people like that all of our lives. Okay, little Frenchie, let's talk about him for a moment, little Frenchie. Little Frenchie tried to escape at every opportunity. Captain Vertz even put him on a work detail, hoping that if he stayed outside of the stockade and got double rations, maybe he'd stop trying to escape. That didn't deter little Frenchie. He determined to escape anyway. And he was always caught or he'd come back in a few days because he had no idea what he was doing or where he was going. And he'd get hungry and sick. One time he came back naked and Vertz, instead of punishing him, just got him a, a set of clothes and sent him back into the stockade. Little Frenchie one time tried to escape while they were taking him to the blacksmith shop to try to shackle him to a ball for, trying, for having previously tried to escape. Finally, Captain Vertz has had enough. And Vertz has determined that little Frenchie, little Frenchie will never escape from Andersonville again. What did the mean Captain Vertz do? He wrote little Frenchie a pass and put him on the train for the federal lines. And the pass said, please let push, send this man to the federal lines. Thank you, Henry Vertz. Little Frenchie did not believe he was being released. And on his way to the federal lines, he escaped from the train. But he did finally make it to the federal lines, although being chased by dogs at the time. Okay, most of the escapes. Okay, these are myths about Andersonville. First myth we've already discussed. Most of the prisoners, um, the myth is that most of the prisoners escaped by digging tunnels. No, very few did, and maybe none did at all. Another myth about Andersonville, the prisoners were savagely attacked by bloodhounds that were used to track down the prisoners. I almost resent that because the man who handled the uh, bloodhounds is probably a cousin of mine, but he was from White County, Georgia. Now, he did not have a pack of bloodhounds. He had a pack of mutts. He, this guy could hardly have afforded bloodhounds. He was in the business of tracking down escaped slaves. And I might add that his dogs were not particularly good at tracking down escaped prisoners. Now, I don't know, I'd hope that you were never in the business of having to track down escaped slaves. But the people who own the slaves, they get very upset if your dogs bite their slaves. So his dogs were not trained to hurt anybody. There is not one account of a prisoner who was caught by the dogs ever being bitten by the dogs. In fact, one prisoner said that the worst thing that happened when the dogs caught, caught up to you is that they would lick you to death or something. Anyway, Mr. Turner, the man who ran the camp dogs, he would ride up, he'd give you a hand, lift you up on the back of his saddle and ride you back to camp. Where if, if you had escaped from a work detail, Captain Vertz would have you punished. Uh, but anyway, th this leads us to our next myth. Captain Vertz severely punished the returned prisoners. No such claims were made by anybody who actually witnessed abuse. But uh, there were witnesses, however, who defended Captain Vertz, prisoners, who said that usually the worst thing you got from Captain Vertz was a strong dose of his famous profanity. And he was known to put people like little Frenchie just back into the prison and just be all, gone with you, as it is. Uh, there was a Colonel Candler uh, who inspected Andersonville prison, and he found a uh, one of the prisoners who sealed in the stocks. 
these are a wooden board contraption where you were forced to sit in one position all day long. And the prisoner was reading a novel. And Candler came up to him and said, son, how long are you, how long are you supposed to be punished today? And the soldier looked up at him and said, what time is it, sir? And he said, it's one o'clock. He said, okay, I've got a two hour punishment, so it's about 30, I've got about another hour. He said, what did you do? He said, I escaped and Captain Vertz put me in the stocks for two hours as a punishment. Hardly seems like a brutal off of brutality to me, but I guess it all depended on what novel he was reading. Okay, another myth. No one actually escaped from Andersonville. We'll discuss that in a moment. Another false claim, over 160 persons escaped from Andersonville. Also not true. Okay, now let's talk realities here as far as escape goes. In all of history, there's only been one successful mass escape that we know of. And that was Sabobor extermination camp in Poland on October 14, 1943. The horrors of places like Andersonville and Sobobor, despite that, are most escapes are made by people who just cannot stand confinement of any sort, what is called barbed wire disease. It is almost impossible to have a mass escape, despite the fact that in almost every prison camp in history, the prisoners by far outnumbered the guards and physically could have overwhelmed the guards. Most of the escapes were made from prison work details. Andersonville required 300 men each day to remove the dead, gather firewood, etc. Men on the work detail promised not to escape. They were granted extra rations. They lived outside the stockade. A few prisoners escaped by posing as guards or falsely getting in on an exchange. Other prisoners made incredible journeys of hundreds of miles. Some men hid out in the woods until the war ended. The greatest escape from Andersonville was made by three men. They escaped from Andersonville. They finally reached the Federal Navy at Key West, Florida. They had traveled more than 2,000 miles in order to escape. Some prisoners got lost. They did not know what to do, and they simply hid out in the woods and caves until the war was ended. And some of them escaped from Andersonville, but died out in the wilderness somewhere, which I guess is the ultimate escape. Surviving records show that over 160 men escaped from Andersonville, but most of them actually escaped from trains coming or going to, uh, either coming from or going to the camp and most of them were recaptured and sent to other prisons. The thing is, the Andersonville, Andersonville records did not show which prisoners end up at other camps, going back to other camps. Most of the unsuccessful escapes were not recorded. Why bother with the paperwork? Just put him back in the stockade. Prison roles do not reflect escapes as prisoners would cover for their comrades. Rather, your mess could be punished if members of your mess that is your eating group, had tried to escape. So you got other prisoners to fill in for the escape prisoners and lie about their identities. Um, some prisoners claim that they escaped from Andersonville, but all they did was they just really survived having been at Andersonville. By different sources, something is apparently known of every one of these successful escapes. Only an estimate of 800 to 900 of the almost 49,000, uh, 49, should be 39,000 Andersonville veterans still lived as late as 1890. Only 800 to 900 men out of 39,000 were still alive by 1890. However, of the 24 men who did escape from Andersonville, 24 or 25 men who did escape, Almost all of them lived, lived long lives. And many of them continue trying to escape for the rest of their lives. 
including one man uh, who escaped from several things in his lifetime before he fi death finally caught up to him at the soldier's home that he was living in in the 20th century. Uh, as I said, some of the successful escapes were made south of the Florida coast and passing federal vessels. Escaping from Andersonville could also mean that you were part of the garrison or one of the guards and you deserted because you couldn't take Andersonville anymore. One of the great untold stories about Civil War prisons and escapes is that the enslaved people proved decisive in most successful escapes. You find very, very, very few federal escape attempts that came anywhere near succeeding that do not mention black people, particularly slaves, helping the escape prisoners helping the escape prisoners. If you escaped from the stockade, well, the first things you wanted to do was find some slaves. Some slaves would turn you in, but most slaves would feed you and hide you and help get you to the next plantation. Then I might add that some of the soldiers who the slaves helped to escape refused to help the slaves escape to the federal lines because while escaping from a Confederate prison was a mild, received a mild punishment, helping slaves to escape could get a white man hanged. African Americans built Andersonville and buried its dead when the prisoners kept using the burial detail to escape. Uh, the enslaved people had an underground railroad for helping their own to escape to the north. And now they use the same underground railroad network to help Yankee soldiers to escape to the north. And this is a weird irony. You see here uh, a painting by Winslow Homer called Near Andersonville. And this reflects a peculiar irony. Federal armies invaded the south eventually for the purpose, one of the purposes being to free the slaves. But many of those Yankee soldiers ended up captured and they end up being freed by the same enslaved people that they figure, at least on paper, came south to, to liberate, came south to liberate. Some white people, even slave owners, also helped escape prisoners in cooperation with African Americans. Many white Southerners opposed the war in various ways, and helping POWs to escape became their way of resistance to the Confederacy. General Winder actually believed that the people living around Andersonville were stockpiling food and guns, and that they were going to help the prisoners to escape, thinking that a planned escape with the cooperation of the local population would be less dangerous to the local population than if the prisoners just finally overwhelmed the garrison and uh, fled. For decades after Andersonville closed as a prison, the local black community commemorated the soldiers buried at Andersonville on Memorial Day, and they still do that today. They still do that today. White people would not. White people would not. Okay. Now, you can visit Andersonville and under much more pleasant circumstances than maybe your ancestor did. First off, there's the Andersonville National Historic Site and National Cemetery. It is also the home of the United States POW Museum and the town of Andersonville. And the town of Andersonville is made up as a Civil War era um, tourist attraction. And while you're there, you can see the monument to Captain Verts that was put up by the United Daughters of the Confederacy. On your way to Andersonville, be sure to stop in Columbus, Georgia. It is a great place to visit. They have the National Civil War Naval Museum. They have historic Columbus. You can take tours of historic Columbus. Columbus was not destroyed during the Civil War, and it still has many mansions and buildings and factories and such that go back to the Civil War. 
In fact, their community center was a Confederate cannon factory. Also, while you're in Columbus, you can visit the United States Infantry Museum at Fort Benning, which has recently been redone and it's spectacular. And you, while you're in Columbus, you can visit Westville. Westville is an 1860s Georgia town that never existed. They took all these buildings from the 1850s and 60s, moved them to Columbus and made a town out of it. And you ride around not in a tour mobile, you ride around in the back of a mule drawn wagon. And you see all these people doing the things they would have been doing in the 1860s in buildings that were there in the 1860s. Amazing thing to see. And then finally, only 30 minutes from Andersonville is a Jimmy Carter National Historic Park. Now, the Jimmy Carter National Historic Park is not so much about Jimmy Carter as it is about being a teenager in South Georgia on the eve of World War II. And uh, I only, I, one of my big regrets is my mother did not live long enough to have seen this. She would have loved it. But the museum is in the high, what used to be Carter's High School. And it's all done, like I say, in the 1930, as it was in the 1930s and the 1940s. And uh, as I say, it's a hoot. Okay. Andersonville has never been forgotten. I sort of started this talk with that. And that's kind of the way we should finish it. Captain uh, Cap Sumter had few formal histories until recent times, which uh, uh, I still don't understand that. But it was often mentioned in memoirs, reminiscences in newspapers, and even in congressional debates. Veterans held reunions at Andersonville. These soldiers are at the Providence Spring. It was brutally hot in the summer of 1864. The men did not have adequate water to drink. There was a bolt of lightning that hit the ground and it opened a spring that had been accidentally covered when the stockade was built. And with cooperation from the guards, the prisoners were able to get all the water they wanted from what they came to call the Providence Spring. But it's funny, uh, a debate between the prisoners and the guards after the war raged for years over the circumstances of the Providence Spring. By the way, the black gentleman that you see here helps to make, help maintain the cemetery and the prison site for many years. Andersonville is referred to in movies and even had a made-for-TV miniseries. McKinley Cantor received the Pulitzer Prize for his novel Andersonville, and Saul Levitt's play Andersonville Trial earned an Emmy and a Peabody Award. The uh, made-for-TV movie uh, Andersonville trial is not accurate on some things, but that's okay. Rented on Netflix. William Shatner played uh, Chapman, the uh, federal prosecutor. George C. Scott directed it. Uh, Ernest Borgnine is in it. A lot of your favorite actors. Andersonville trial, rent it. Uh, so it's, check on Google. Maybe it's available for free. All right. Now, uh, I'll be happy to, before I talk about your, your handout on how to research a relative who might have been at Andersonville, could I have your questions, please? Okay, class, if you have a question at this point, uh, please unmute your microphone and feel free to ask. And Robert, while I'm waiting for them to do that, I've got a couple questions based on what you were talking about so far. Uh, you, said that, you said that there were three women in the prison uh, I assume that there's been articles or books written about those women? Uh, no, ma'am. There is not. Oh. Because there was so little information. However, there's a chapter in my book on them. And even I never found all the answers that I wanted. And one of the reasons I did the whole chapter on them is I'm hoping somebody out there who has finds something will read that chapter and maybe answer some questions for me. Uh, particularly with regard to the hunt, the couple that had the baby. I suspect that they were that they were the only people who never wanted to leave Andersonville because I think there were some ugly secrets about their capture that caused them to go underground, if you would, for years after the prison 
after after they left the prison. And I've been in touch with their family, uh, which finally marked their graves, by the way, because of my research on them in order to honor them. But there's definitely something that was going on there that's not clearly explained. But not all mysteries get solved. That's true. Yeah, and women are just, as you know, in, in genealogy are notoriously hard to, to trace backwards in time for many, many reasons. But what a, what a really interesting uh, story that there were three women there. That, that's a fascinating story I was not aware of. Um, now, you mentioned the 24 that escaped. Um, I, are there any books written about any of those 24? No. Uh, however, there are a chapter in my book. <laughs> As I said, that's what got me into doing a book. It was an article on the men who escaped that got too big to be an article anymore. So it becomes the biggest chapter in my book. But in, my, in that chapter, I can go into much more detail. I can name more names. And of course, I give you the sources. Please promise me, if you ever do anything on local history, if you ever do anything on history, be sure to have footnotes and be sure to document your facts. Um, in, in all these years, I've done all these history projects and then done the genealogy that goes with it and whatever. Nothing has ever driven me up a wall than something without the sources given or the sources misgiven or something like that. My first project was in 1974 when I was George's first history intern. And it was on a Revolutionary War battlefield called Kettle Creek in Georgia. And uh, my partner in this, the guy who actually worked for the state, he was my partner and supervisor, he got so frustrated. He said, Bob, here's what we're going to do. We're going to write the report, and we're going to put footnotes in it, and we're not going to publish the footnotes. He was so fed up with no sources, I persuaded him to let us put the footnotes in there, and I still refer to them myself even now. But please, if you write anything like this, please use footnotes and please put your sources in. Yes, that's something we do stress almost all the time here in the class. Um, citation, citation, citations. <laughs> okay, I see Kathy, you have your hand up. Would you like, go ahead and like to turn on your yeah. microphone? Yes, I thank you very much. And this was very interesting. And because you're going to move into another section, and talk about some of the POW resources. And I saw that another gentleman, uh, someone else had POW ancestors. I have a POW ancestor, Fort Delaware, New Jersey, Peapatch Island. You did not mention that is one of the more horrible uh, <laughs> prisons. So I guess that's good. Um, I just want to say it kind of tracks along with what you're talking about. He was captured first day of Battle of Gettysburg. His entire unit, 2nd Mississippi, was captured. Goes to Peapatch Island. And then when he's incarcerated, he dies about four months later. And there is a smallpox epidemic that's documented. He is buried over in New Jersey at Fins Point uh, National Cemetery. In fact, I'm looking at his name. I've been to both of these places. and. I'm looking at his name on the, the big monument there right now. But you, you mentioned something. So if you have any comments about doing research on that side, I would appreciate it. And the other thing is you mentioned people going over, you know, to the other side. He had a brother that's listed in the records of Second Mississippi. That they were all from the same county, same place in Mississippi. And it said, went over to the enemy. So I'm curious about what that might have meant. And he does not right. die, but okay, I don't know what good. happens to him. Very good. Thank First you. off, I had, I had several ancestors and relatives who were at Fortress Delaware, and one is buried in the cemetery that you mentioned. Okay. Uh, Fortress Delaware is in Delaware, just outside Wilmington. And you could visit it in the spring and summer. And it's just a who you walk over this bridge and you are stopped by the Union Provo Marshal wants to know why you are there. And you explain that you're there to visit your relative and they write you a pass. So you can enter where the camp was. Now, it was a war. It was a war of 1812 era brick fort, but the camp was most of the island. 
However, escaping from it was no big deal. It was almost a revolving door. And uh, so that, you know, escape from there was not so bad or so difficult. And the biggest problem you had was that if you didn't know how to swim, you were in a lot of trouble. Okay, now uh, the, the records of Fortress Delaware Prison survived. They're on National Archives microfilm. And that's mentioned in your uh, handout. It's, I believe it's record group 249. And a lot of those records, prisoner of war records, have been scanned onto Ancestry, uh, on Ancestry and AncestryLibrary.com. Uh, now, your ancestor went over to the Union. Uh, I've had several relatives who did that too. And in fact, some of them not only went over to the Union, they never, they were there to begin with, they just never left. But they were Southerners, they were Georgians anyway. Okay, uh, now, most of the men and women, men and women, who reached the federal lines and deserted to the Union, they went north of the Ohio River, where they got jobs working in factories. In fact, some of these people did this not because of the war, per se, or politics, it's just they live very miserable lives in the South, and the U United States government was going to give them free transportation to good jobs and a better quality of life than they had ever known in the South, black and white. So a lot of people deserted the Confederacy just for the wartime jobs in the North, and some of them never came back. Now, if your ancestor goes to the Union lines, your ancestor may work for the Union Army. He may work for a private company like a textile factory or something, or, or he might join the Union Army. There were six full regiments of Southerners. And these were called the galvanized Yankees, and they have compiled service records. And then there were other Union units that also took in Confederate deserters. Uh, in fact, a story you would probably like there was a regiment raised in California, and uh, they wanted to fight for the Union, but they didn't want to fight in Indians in California. They wanted to fight Confederates in the East. So they traveled all the way to Massachusetts and enlisted as a Massachusetts cavalry unit. They were captured by the Confederates, and they found themselves at Andersonville. At Andersonville, they were given a chance to join a Confederate Irish regiment which they did. They were then captured by the Union Army, but instead of executing them, they put the Union Army put them in a Confederate in a prison camp. Then in the prison camp, they were offered a chance to leave the prison camp. You're going to love this. If they agreed to serve in the West fighting Indians as galvanized Yankees. Anyway, this, this Yankee reg, regiment that had served in the Confederacy, whatever, there are stories that after the war, they drew pensions from both the state of Tennessee and from the United States government for fighting the Indians. Now, the best way to check for this is to first check for your ancestor's Confederate service record. If your ancestor joined the Union Army from, after having been in a Confederate unit, that's supposed to be mentioned in their Confederate service record. And if in their Confederate service record it says that they joined the Union Army, then it means they will also have a federal service record, a federal service record. And federal service records are so much better than Confederate service records. More of the paperwork has survived. Uh, federal soldiers, you get county and state of birth, physical descriptions, all sorts of good things um, from a federal service record. So you get the best of both armies, if you would. Another good question. That was a good question. Uh, any other questions? Go ahead and turn on your microphone. I have a question. Go ahead, Liz. I live across the street from Grant's tomb, and the visitor center is closed, but I'm wondering when it opens, I'm going to see if they have the correspondence you mentioned with Abraham Lincoln about the prisoner exchange. But in the meantime, in your book, do you have the full letter? 
No, I, uh, okay, the lady asked, the lady asked, uh, these letters about the prisoner exchange, do I have the letters in my book? No, I do not, but I cite them. And the letters are published, it's either series three or series four, whichever one deals with the prisoner of war, prisoner of war records, in a huge series of books called The War of the Rebellion, also called the ORs. Whenever the United States gets itself involved in a war, Congress does an investigation after the war. I'm sure any moment they're going to start one on Afghanistan. Well, they start a investigation of what we what happened in that war, and then they publish the results. And this started with the Civil War, and this is like 159 volumes called The War of the Rebellion. And one of the smaller series at the end, it's either series three or series four, deals with the prison camps, and it includes this correspondence between Lincoln and Grant. There re really, really, really needs to be a good book done on prisoner, the prisoner exchange, its failure, how it was revived, all of that. But like William Marvel wrote in his book, um, Andersonville, The Last Depot, Marvel wrote, a really good book on the prisoner exchange needs to be written, but this is not going to be it. And I said the same thing in my book. That is a very partisan subject, a very complicated subject, but a very worthy subject that needs a solid, honest researcher to explore and publish. Great questions. Okay, any other questions before Robert goes on to the second part? Okay, Robert, looks like you can go on to the next part. All right, very good. Okay. Uh, one of the other things in my book is a bit dated, is as an appendix, I have a bit, a bit dated uh, appendix on how to research someone who might have been at Andersonville. I do, I love to do history, and I use genealogy, I do history in order to do genealogy instead of genealogy to do history, if you would. But I never forget my roots, and I never pass up on an opportunity to share information with people, like you nice folks, about how to do research. And so this led to my researching Andersonville prisoners, guards, and others. Okay, basically this is the uh, beginning here uh, of the basic background on that. All right, Jack Lindquist. Now this is one of the important points I wanted to stress. The best list that was ever done of the Andersonville prisoners and other prisoners was done by Jack Lundquist. In fact, he came to my library for many years to do research. And he did research in the state adjutant general's books. Now, let me explain about that. All right, after the Civil War, the United States government had warehouses full of records, including Ford's theater, believe it or not, crammed full of records. But this was such a mess, nobody could use them. So what the individual states did was the individual states published rosters of their Union soldiers. Uh, and this was to help the Union soldiers prove their service for purposes of getting federal pensions. And these were called the Action General's Reports. We have them here on microfilm, at what, microfiche here at Wallace State. Jack went through these. Now, these records were done without the help of the federal government in its records. And so what would happen is these states would have people who interviewed the old soldiers. All right, who was in your company and what happened to them? Well, uh, Joe, Joe Hale, he was my sergeant and he was with me and he was captured with me at Andersonville and he died at Andersonville. And you go to the federal records and there's no federal record about what happened to Joe Hale. But in the Adjutant General's report, it says he died at Andersonville. So the Adjutant General's reports were spectacular. I just wish that they were more, they were easily more usable. Some outfit like, I wish that Fold 3 would scan them or something. Okay, well anyway, Jack went through all of those in compiling his work. And you can still, you can go see it for free. This is on a free site and all the information. However, there are a couple of sources for Andersonville soldiers that he did not use. And we'll talk about those 
next. But if I'm looking for somebody possibly being a prisoner at Andersonville, I would go to this. Now, oddly enough, if you go to Andersonville National Historic Site online or in person, they refuse to put Jack's uh, roster up. They refuse to have anything to do with it, even though it's so much better than anything they have uh, on that. Now, by the way, at Andersonville National Park, uh, National Historic Site, they also have rosters of the known Confederate personnel who were at the prison, not just the prisoners. Okay, moving right along down here. All right, these days there are all these wonderful sources you can go to where you can word search your ancestor's name. If you think your ancestor was Andersonville, you can word search your an ancestor and the word Andersonville at the same time. And maybe find them in a book. But this includes Half the Trust, which has scanned millions of news, millions of books online for us to read. It's just great and it's free. Chestor, it's also free. And it's millions of uh, articles in scholarly and genealogical journals. The Making of America, uh, and which I believe is on, actually now on Hathi Trust. Uh, newspapers, the Digital Library of Georgia Newspapers. That's a great place to find out if your ancestor deserted from Andersonville. Uh, and it's free. The Digital Library of Georgia Newspapers is a great source. Newspaper Archives is a subscription site, but maybe a, news, maybe a genealogy library near you allows you free access to it. Be careful, though. Some of these libraries that get free access, they only get access for their region of the country, not the whole country. And uh, so that can be a problem. Ancestry.com, et cetera. You can actually type you can actually type in Andersonville as a surname just to see what turns up and some wonderful things can turn up. The Library of Congress has a free national online newspaper database called Chronicling America. And it, by the way, also includes a list of newspapers that have been digitized out there, some of which might relate to your part of the country or where your family live and you can search those newspapers online. All right, moving right along. All right, as I said before, a lot of the records of Andersonville survive, and they survive because of the, they were used as evidence at Henry Vertz's trial. Okay, uh, this includes what survives of the Andersonville registers. Now, I could be mistaken, but I think that these Andersonville registers are either on Ancestry or they're on Fold 3. I think they are on Ancestry, but you can search this out. At the National Archives on Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C., they have Record Group 249. Record Group 249. These are the federal records of Confederate prisoners of war and federal prisoners of war. What survives of them? And it's just, they just have fabulous things, original records, many of which have never been microfilmed. Now, in Record Group 249, in Record Group 249, they have these little slips of white paper. And the white paper tells you that the man was, gives you the books in their collection, the manuscript books that de detail for you where the prisoner was captured and other details. And if you really want to get down and dirty, and I mean dirty, don't wear your nice clothes, go to Record Group 249 and have them pull those sheets for your ancestor, presuming the sheets are not in your ancestor's service record, which my, uh, my experience is that they're not. Now, I'll give you an example of this. All right, Captain Herbert Hunt, Captain Herbert Hunt, he and his ship, and I don't know the name of his ship, he and his ship were captured along with his pregnant wife and they went to Andersonville. Okay, they both have a sheet of paper in this record group 249. And his sheet, by the way, the sheets make no mention of the baby. I don't know why the baby doesn't get a sheet. Well, I guess because the baby was never captured, it was just born there. But anyway, be that as it may, uh, on his sheet, 
it says that he was captured at Fairfield, North Carolina by a Captain Larat. Okay, I believe that's Captain Surratt who led the local Chungun County, North Carolina Home Guard. Anyway, the only record I have of where Captain Hunt was captured is that sheet of paper. So there could easily be some little detail about your ancestors' capture or his time as a prisoner of war in this stuff, in two, record group 249, that uh, are, is not, would, would not otherwise, you might not get otherwise. Now, I presume that when COVID is behind us and things are back to normal at the National Archives, which may be months from now, you may be able to write to the National Archives on Pennsylvania Avenue and have them make you a copy of that sheet of paper. Okay. Of course, they have uh, service records, regular National Archives service records that could easily mention that your ancestor was held as a prisoner. More information on federal, any federal records of the Civil War are in that excellent book by Kenneth Munden, Munden and Henry Beers, The Union, A Guide to Federal Archives Relating to the Civil War. All right, Jack did not use anything from Record Group 249 except the microfilm, and he used that microfilm here in my library. However, uh, also he did not use the Brooklyn Historical Society in Brooklyn, New York. For whatever reason, they have a huge pile of the hospital work records from Andersonville. They've never allowed this stuff to be copied by anybody. If you go there, you have to copy it by hand. But Jack, for whatever reason, Jack refused to fool with that, which I think potentially might have a few more names in it or something. Okay. Uh, now, All right, if your ancestor was a guard or some other personnel at the Andersonville prison, uh, of course, there are the Confederate service records, however incomplete that they may be. But there's also a company called the Broadfoot Company. And the Broadfoot Company reprinted tons of published Civil War material from way back when, and then added the most fabulous indexes to the Civil War material. It even is, has a slang name. It's called a Broadfoot Index. But in a Broadfoot Index, you not only get all the names, you get all the uh, uh, places mentioned, you get all the things mentioned, you get all the battles mentioned, you get all the regiments mentioned. You get all the regiments mentioned. Now, among the many, many records that the Broadfoot Company reprinted and indexed is a set of books called Confederate Veteran. Confederate veteran. Confederate veteran was a magazine of the old Confederate soldiers. And they included obituaries, reminiscences. They argued about things endlessly in those pages. This is just absolutely delightful. I'll give you an example of how you use Confederate veteran. I looked up my ancestor, Q. Columbus Martin's service record in the 55th Georgia. And it were just pages and pages of stuff but it made no sense to me. Something about the regiment was overran at Cumberland Gap, and my ancestor ends up a prisoner, at, I mean a guard, at, a member of the garrison at Andersonville, and then he ends up as a member of the garrison at Florence, South Carolina, and none of this makes any sense to me at all. I go to Confederate veteran, and I looked under Georgia, then I looked under infantry, then I looked under 55th. And there was a reference. I looked up the reference, and it was a memoirs of the regiment's second in command. And he explained everything. The regiment was overran at uh, Cumberland Gap. He ended up a prisoner at Sandusky. But the men who escaped from the federal prisons and made it south, along with people like my ancestor, who was not actually at Cumberland Gap, all end up in three companies, all that was left of the regiment were three companies. And it was the worst regiment in the Confederate Army. The uh, men forced their colonel to resign because he was stealing their wagons and stuff and selling it. 
Of course, he may have been out of his head because he had syphilis. Anyway, they forced him at bayonet point to resign. When they, these three companies get to Andersonville, they are so lousy, the regular Confederate Army refuses to take them in, so they're left as a garrison at Andersonville. They were never guards on the wall. They were never guards on the wall because they said if they were ever put on the wall, they would open the gates and with the prisoners escape to General Sherman. Anyway, I only understood all of this because I read this account in Confederate Veteran. So check the indexes to Confederate Veteran in addition to the service records and such, and see what's available. Now, uh, also Broadfoot has done a number of other Confederate sources, but also some federal sources that are really good too, all with that famous Broadfoot index. You remember that 159 volumes of the War of the Rebellion that I mentioned? Broadfoot published another 100, but again, with a Broadfoot index, with a Broadfoot index. Um, so that, that's there for us to use. Now, I should mention, if anybody wants to know more about Civil War research, Confederate, Union, or either, then send me an email, robert.davis at one word, wallacestate.edu. Tell me what you want. I'll send you an electronic copy of the handouts, the Civil War handouts for free. Okay. Um, all right. I say other things here that give that in more detail, if you would, but that's uh, most of what that's most of what uh, I wanted to point out from the handout. Do we have some more questions? Okay, class, any other questions? Uh, there's some really great resources here that he's talking about. Okay, well, while they're thinking about the questions, Robert, do you mind spending just a few moments at least on talking about your, your library, your genealogy library? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, this library was started about 35 or 40 years ago. Um, it was originally started as a continuing education class in genealogy. Then it was decided to add a few history books, a few genealogy books to encourage people to come to the continuing education classes. The head of the history department wanted local history books and he wanted genealogy sources because he wanted to assign his history students to research their Civil War ancestors their ancestors in the federal census records, things like that. So all this comes together. And then about almost exactly 30 years ago, I was hired to pull it all together and expand it. And when the program was first started, we had a library with microfilm. I had a huge budget. And uh, I took a group of, I took people regularly on field trips all across the country. Twice we went to England even. But um, anyway, this was all the dream child of the president of the college. And after he retired and then shortly afterwards died, we got in a new management and things have been cut back severely. The trips are gone. Uh, the continuing education classes are ups and downs, but I still get a really nice budget to run my program on, uh, buy books and things. And people come from all over the country to use our family folders, our books, our microfilm, uh, our computers even, and uh, to get that one for sure to pick up our handouts, which have also become legends. And can my students join your email list? Uh, yes, ma'am, you can, you can come anytime, uh, anytime we're open. We're completely open to everybody. Uh, also, I have a mailing list. And if anyone would like to be on my mailing list, just email me again, robert.davis at one word, wallacestate.edu. And I'll be happy to put you on our mailing list. That's where I put news and things like that on it. And uh, sometimes some ideas and announcements of meetings. In fact, your previous presentations, the previous presentations I've done and the presentations you open to the public, they're going to be in my next newsletter. Thank you, Robert. Our, our presentations are always open to the public. 
So we're, we're thankful for any publicity we can get. <laughs> we really appreciate it. And I got to tell the class, I've been on Robert's list now for several years, and it's it's a really great email uh, list to be on. So I encourage everyone to go ahead and join his list if you if you have the opportunity. Uh, and with that, uh, let's see here. Uh, any more? I would just want to make sure that I give the class complete opportunity to ask any questions. Any last minute questions for Robert? Okay. Well, Robert, before I say uh, thank you very much, I just want to remind the class that uh, our class will go on for at least another hour uh, after our guest speaker logs off. And uh, I will be stopping the recording in just a minute. But before I do that, I just want to let everyone know if, you, if you're going to leave uh, after our guest speaker is done, uh, if there's something in the chat box that you want to download before you leave, please do, because once you log out, you will not have access to that chat box again. So uh, if you want to download the chat box, all you got to do is click on the three little dots at the bottom of the chat box. And if you can't find the three little dots, you can just copy and paste the whole chat box and, and just email it to yourself if you'd like. Uh, and with that, Robert, I'm going to say thank you very, very much for your time and once again your expertise. Uh, I've learned, as always, so much about uh, the, the Civil War every time you speak. So um, once again, thank you so much.